Hello, my name is Adrian Crenshaw, and this video is on installing Nessus on Kali Linux and doing a credentialed scan. I have an older video on Nessus. Unfortunately, it's getting a little bit long in the tooth since it's almost nine years old, and they've improved the product quite a bit in that amount of time. So I figured it'd be a good time to go ahead and make an updated version of that video. And since people also are interested in getting installed in Kali Linux, I figured I'd show that and show a few more features that I don't think I showed in the original video, like credentialed scans. You can get more information on the hosts that you're doing a vulnerability check on. Now, the first question someone might ask is, what is Nessus? I assume that if you're watching this video, you already have an idea what Nessus is, but essentially it's a vulnerability scanner. It scans a box, or a series of boxes, and tells you likely vulnerabilities that are on it. Now, the version of Nessus I'll be using here is the home version, since it's free. But it has some limitations. However, it's still good for teaching you the basics of how Nessus works. So for students or people just using this in the home lab, this should work pretty well. You're limited to 16 IP addresses. So once it's found 16 IP addresses in your home network, you're done. That's all the ones it's going to check. Also, there's certain features that are not in Nessus Home that are in other versions of Nessus, depending on what you get, such as compliancy checks, content audits, or access to the Nessus virtual appliance. You can download Nessus from that first link that I have on this particular screen, and you can get the key from the second link. So we'll go proceed to do that. First of all, you're going to want to go to this page to download Nessus. I've gone here for Linux and download the 32-bit version. I've already downloaded in the background to save time. Also, you're going to want to get an activation code. To do that, you just have to go to this other page and enter your information. I'll say, yes, yeah, sure, email me. And I agree to the terms of service. Luckily, you seem to be able to get multiple registration codes because I've had to, uh, well, practice these demos quite a few times. I already have it downloaded, and I can go check for my key here in a bit. More than likely, it might be there right now. The next thing I need to do is actually install Nessus. And to do that, we're going to have to use the dpackage utility. Now, I downloaded it to root, so right there it is. Use dpackage. Helps if you make sure you put everything in the right order. Dash I for install option and Nessus. It installs, does its thing. Oh, by the way, one thing you might want to do before doing all the other installs, do an apt get update apt get dist upgrade. So you get to make sure you have all the newest package for Kali Linux. Okay, we got Kali installed. Now there might be a few other features we'd want to do. We can start Kali in a couple different ways. Sorry, we can start Nessus in a couple different ways. We can go Etsy init d Nessus d start. That's one way. Or we can also do service Nessus D start. Now in this case, it's going to give me an error message, more than likely since it's already running. That's fine and dandy. Now let's say we want it to automatically start every time the machine boots. We can easily do that by doing update RCD and Nessus D enable. And there we go. Oh, another feature you might want to know, every 24 hours, I believe it is, it's going to update plugins automatically, but there are all cases where you might want to force that. So to do that, you can run this particular script inside of opt Nessus. Sbin, and it's Nessus-update plugins. Now I'm not going to run that now since I haven't even ran it the first time yet. So there's a few features we have to actually uh, get functioning yet.
I'm going to copy this and open it up in Ice Weasel. Now, the first time I hit that, it's going to give me a warning about the certificate. I'll just say yes. It's self-signed, so... Now we're here on the intro page. We'll say next, and we got to create our initial account. I'm going to create one using my handle. And I'm going to have to put in an activation code. Luckily, I've prepped this up already, and here we go. This is the activation code I registered for a little bit ago. And now it's going to start downloading plugins. Depending on the amount of bandwidth you have and how many other people are downloading plugins at the same time, this can take a little bit of time. So at this particular point, I'm going ahead and pause the video, and we'll come back to it here shortly. Okay, plugins have been downloaded and everything's initialized. So now we can log in with the account we created previously. However, we can't really scan anything yet. We have to go create a policy. So let's go do that. And I'm going to go with something fairly simplistic to start with. So we're going to go to policies, new policies, and we're going to create a basic policy. Basic network scan. There's a few other options in here. Ignore the scan mobile devices if you want to start off everything being advanced profile so you can really get into the options. Those are all in here. But we're just going to go with basic scan to keep things simple for the time being. I'm going to call this scan ABC for my initials. Basic no creds, as in no credentials. You make it private or shared. The difference there is if you create other users, you can give them rights to be able to see it and use it. And you can also fill in a description. Next up, internal or external, I'm going to say internal. It's going to be a few less ports, but uh, hopefully we can get some results back a little faster. I'm going to say next. And now we can set up authentication method. But we're not quite ready for that yet. We'll come back to this in a bit. And notice right here that we only have Windows and SSH for the time being. I'll explain getting around that here in a bit. Hit save and now we have this profile. Let's go ahead and actually scan some hosts with just this very, very basic profile. Now, there's also ways we can designate our targets. I'm going to be using this list right here and I just copied and pasted it for convenience. But there's other ways of designating targets as well. I'm going to say new scan. I'm just going to call it no credit. That's the one we have chosen. And we can designate targets different ways. 192.168 slash 24. In this case we're using cited notation. Essentially we're telling it 192.168.1.anything can be in that scan range. Now remember though we only have 16 IP addresses we can hit with the home version. Now you, those who are familiar with nmap might be used to using the syntax something like a wildcard. That does not actually work. You can do things like, let's say you want to scan the first 100, 1 through 100, that syntax will work. Also, you could do something like 192.168.1.2, and that will get both of them. Or they can be on separate lines, which is what I'm going to do next. So I paste in all of those, and those are the ones I have set to be targeted. I'm going to launch them, and I'm going to use this as a comparison later on. Now, in the meantime, I'm going to talk a little bit about how credential scans work. The reason why you might want to do a credential scan is you get a little bit more information. Normally, external or on-site scans only find information based on what it can probe without authenticating. It's going to do this via hitting the box, looking at the ports, finding banner grabs, 
sending certain probes and seeing how it responds and, and try to determine what version of software is listening on particular ports and based on that try to figure out if uh, it has a vulnerability. In the case of let's say web applications it might try a few different SQL ingestion methods that are common, a few uh, cross-site scripting methods that are common and all that and then see if it can get somewhere. Credential scans are a little bit better because, well quite a bit better actually, you can actually log into the box and scan the file system and get into things that you normally wouldn't be able to do and generally you get a much greater level of detail and cut down the number of false positives you're going to have. There's all sorts of things you can get from a credential scan that you wouldn't necessarily be able to get using just a general network scan. One thing would be patch level. You can get this via, via looking at the file system, looking at the registry, looking at config settings and figure out what's going on. And on the uh, the config settings, by actually being able to look at the file system and uh, other configuration files, you can figure out if they've made standard mistakes that are, uh, well, not in their own best security interest. Things that you wouldn't necessarily know unless you were able to get on the local file system. Also, doing a credential scan allows you to find local vulnerabilities. Let's say there's no real no accessible vulnerabilities you can do to get root privilege or admin privileges. However, if you can get a lower level of privilege, and then once you have some kind of shell in the box already, escalate to root or admin or system, then that's an important thing to know, and that's much easier to find out using a credential scan. Also, you can find non-external services. Let's say they have a, a service on the local machine that's only listening on local host, but it's not bound to an external adapter. You're not going to find that with a network port scan. However, you will be able to find it after doing a credential scan and various other things along those lines. Now, a important thing to know is you want to have a good access level to be able to do the scans properly. You might get results back if you're not running as admin or root, but for the best possible response, you want to be able to be admin or root. So in the case of Unix systems, you want to make sure that you have root privileges or some kind of account that can S you to root, and on Windows, you want to make sure that you have administrative privileges. Also, depending on how your boxes are set up, there are various settings you might need to tweak to get things to function optimally. For instance, uh, sometimes remote registry access will have to be turned on, or in the case of uh, any malware package in the box, you might have to do some work to get around those and make sure they don't block the scans. Now, if we go into advanced settings, which I'll show here in a bit, there's all sorts of different places where we can set credential settings. First of all is Windows credentials, which is pretty much what it sounds like. When you're scanning Windows boxes, you can set up usernames and passwords for connecting in and scanning the boxes. SSH settings are generally used for Unix hosts, however there's also some interplay with like Cisco equipment and so forth, where you can SSH in, then enable, and then get your job done. Kubo's configuration, we're not going to cover a lot here because I don't have it set up in my home lab, but it's another way of authenticating in and doing credential scans. And there's also ClearText protocol settings where you can set credential scans, but we're not going to show that. And there's some security issues there also because the passwords are going to be going across the network with clear text. But if there's a box you can only tell it into and you still want to do credential scans on it, it is a possibility. Now behind the scenes, there's a whole lot of methods going on. In Linux, of course, we're mostly SSHing in or using Kerberos. In this video, we're going to be showing SSH and two varieties of it. The first one is SSHing in and then using a password to be able to authenticate. The problem with this is if you have hosts out there that you don't trust, someone could put up a SSH box with a Trojan daemon so that whenever you try to log in, it grabs the password. That's not so great. Now, there's a couple of countermeasures to this. You can use a known host file, or what we're going to show which is using public and private keys to authenticate. That way, they don't ever get the passwords. They have to have the public key, but just having the public key doesn't give them the private key to actually be able to authenticate any of the box. As far as Windows is concerned, well, there's so many ways that it authenticates behind the scenes, and I have a large list there. It should be using NTLM version 2 for the case example I'm going to be showing here shortly. Our scan is running, and hopefully it doesn't halt 
We're going to come back and look at it in a bit. But before we can actually set up our scan to use credentials, we have to set up some things on our remote Linux box. So we'll go ahead and do that now. One thing we have to do is set up keys on the remote box. But let's do a couple of things on the remote box first. I'm going to switch over to that one, have it running in another VM. This is a simple X Ubuntu box, nothing too special about it. But we have to do a few things to it before we continue. We want to create a Nessus account that we can scan from. So we'll add user Nessus. Ooh, can't do it yet. Have to be root. So, as you do, add user Nessus. Now we can do it. Uh, Aiden was the first account I added on this box, so it does have privileges to use as you do. We can enter information here. I'll just call it instead of full name. Scan account, give an idea what it's about, no real room number, and I'll skip through most of the, everything else. Say so yes to this, and there we go. Um, to save time, I'm going to do an su do dash i and just have a nice little root prompt so I don't have to su do before everything else. Next up, let's change directory into home nessus. Nothing there right now, do an ls base dash al. We see a few hidden files. We want to create some uh, files in here. So let's go ahead and make a directory and make .ssh. Because we're going to send a file here. Oh, another thing I haven't set up on this box yet. It doesn't actually have a root password. For the way I'm going to transfer this file, I'm going to have to set up a root password. There's other ways of getting it there. If you want to, I suppose you could uh, sneak and edit via thumb drive. So I'm going to do a password, not specifying an account, and set up a password for root. Okay, everything should now be set up for the most part on our target. What we're going to do now is going to generate some keys. And we can do that with SSH keygen. So SSH keygen, and then we have to tell it what algorithm we want to use. In this case, we're going to use digital signature algorithm, DSA. And we're going to take all the defaults. We're going to put it in the .ssh directory, and that's where our private key goes. And we can also get our public key, and we can enter a passphrase if we want. I'm going to leave it with no passphrase for the time being. But it's an extra security option you can enable. So now we have that key and we want to go ahead and put our public key out there. So if I do an ls.sh, notice that I have the public key and the one that doesn't have that pub on the end, that's a private key. And I want to transfer that public key across the network over to my other box. That's easy enough. We'll just do a scp dot sh ssh specify the file in this case we want to make sure we put the pub not the private key because your private key is out there with everybody well it's not particularly private and it's not particularly good for your security now I'm going to double check to make sure I have the uh, right IP address there Get 187, 187, that should be good. And I want to tell it to put it inside of home nessus dot ssh authorized keys. And I'm double checking everything for my notes just to make sure I didn't that finger any things I want to enter. This is the first time we're connecting so it's asking me if I want to accept this fingerprint and yes I do. 
and I got to enter root's password to transfer the file. The file should now be on the other host. So let's go check it out. Yep, there it is. So let's go ahead and set the proper permissions because right now anything probably belongs to root, so we, that's not exactly ideal. At least it won't work for uh, actual scanning of anything with this Nessus account. So let's do a change owner, and we're going to specify that it will be Nessus as the username and group. And the file we're going to specify is Nessus SSH. And that's to get the folder and all the right uh, permissions set in it eventually once we have the correct owner on it. Next, we'll go ahead and do a change mod. And 066, sorry, 600 as a permissions. Nessus dot SSH slash authorized keys and now we're going to do another one this time around we want to set permissions 700 on the folder itself And one last thing we gotta do, we gotta make sure that Nessus can use sudo. So to do that, we use user mod dash a dash uppercase G sudo Nessus. And now hopefully everything is set up appropriately so we can actually do all scanning. Well actually there is one other little step. If we're going to do our testing, switch over here, do SSH, add, and that particular identity has been added. Now we can actually test it using the SSH command, and we're going to tell it to run the ID command on the remote box, just to make sure that we got all of our privileges and such set correctly. we got to tell it what particular private key we want to use, in this case, this ID underscore DSA, and remote host, or an account of course. And the command. And there we go. Apparently it works, and I think we have everything set up so we can actually do a proper scan. Oh, and this scan is completed in the background, no creds. We'll come back and look at this maybe a little bit later. Have we go any policies? We can copy this other one we created previously, and we'll say copy. And we'll go ahead and edit the copy. Instead of no creds, we're going to call this with creds. We'll leave it private and basic and pretty much everything else the same. Now, go into credentials. And we'll set Windows credentials. We'll set up an SMB account. Well, we'll set up two ones actually. One is going to be S, sorry, Nessus domain. And the password I set up for that. I'm going to use this for scanning domain controllers. I can also put in the name of the domain. However, it's not necessary unless you have an account with the same name on the local machine. So let's say you have a machine that has a local account called Nessus and a domain account called Nessus. Then the one that's going to get used first is the one that's on the local account. So in that one circumstance, you will want to use a domain entry. For this, I'm not going to put one in there. There are some other boxes out there that use different account names. So I'm going to put in a second account. 
And this one is going to be Adrian and my own password for scanning some of the other boxes I have out there. Now notice when we're underneath this particular setting that we can go in and set multiple things. We have Windows credentials, we have SSH settings, Kubo settings, and also clear text protocols. We're going to just set up Windows credentials and SSH settings. Now what we want to do here is set it up so we can scan a remote box and use the signatures that was well, the certificates we created earlier, the public and private keys. The reason we want to do this is that it's going to be more secure. If we just had passwords, it's possible someone could man in the middle of us, someone might be able to set up a Trojan SSH host out there and capture our password. We wouldn't want that. So let's go ahead and tell this to use Nessus and we're going to point it to our public and private key. To do this, I have to go ahead and say show hidden files and find my files. Alright, SSH is the public key. It's the private key. I'm not using any password or passphrase for SSH, so I can skip that. I'm going to tell it to use sudo as my privilege, my privilege escalation method. And I'm going to blank out this as far as escalation account is concerned. And my escalation password, I'm going to set to be whatever my password is for that particular account. Since it first tries to authenticate using my public private keys, it has to get through that step first. So hopefully it wouldn't be able to grab this password even if it was Trojan. However, I suppose that does mean you have to keep some uh, privacy on your public key even. I need to actually look into that a little bit more before I can be 100% sure. Okay, we got those in and actually I'm also going to add in just a normal SSH account. So, let's use... Well, I have a Metasploitable instance out there, so we'll scan that. And that's an account on it that I know should work. MSF admin. So, let's save that. There's no one with creds. Let me go back and double check. Oh, another thing I should point out about editing these profiles. If you go into one of these, you click on advanced mode if you don't see all the options you want. You click on advanced mode, continue, and you can check which particular plugins you want. You can also check things like, well, I think general settings. You want to set how port scanning works. You can change that around. You can change the performance parameters. Whatever you need. Just look around these particular options. Right now it's doing default port scan range. You can also specify specific ranges inside of here. Other options you can set up. Plugin options. We're going to run the plugin options and show you that a few things have been disabled already. Like everything that belongs in the brute force category has already been disabled. If we choose to enable everything, we just click on the button, everything turns green, it's all enabled. If some things are enabled, some things are disabled, you'll notice that the button is going to be blue as a mixed. I'm going to set it back to the state it was originally. I just want to show you that you can go in there and you can edit which plugins change what. That would be a subject for a different video, so we're going to leave it as is for the time being. Save this out. And let's go ahead and do a scan with credentials to see how much things might differ. We'll say new scan. We'll call this one with creds and make sure we choose the bright policy and we want to use the same IPs as before so we're going to copy and paste that hope for the best and hit launch we could also have just said upload targets and pull it from the file as well
And this is going to take a little bit of time to run. So in the meantime, I'm going to pause for a bit and come back hopefully after it's completed. While setting up that previous scan, I seem to have encountered some problems. I think because the box I was scanning, the Xubuntu box, was on the same host machine as my Kali box and it caused some network issues. If I went in here and looked at them, you'll notice that some of the scans just didn't quite seem to complete. However, you'll notice that the no credential scan came back with a lot less results than the credentialed scan. Once you're inside of Nessus and have a scan done, there's different tabs you can look at. You can look on these vulnerabilities and go through the list, click on an individual vulnerability, and find out information about it. Usually a link that gives you more information, what the solution is to fix the problem, and a description of the problem itself, as well as information on what the host is and what port that particular vulnerability was found on. You can also just go back to the list of hosts and click on a particular section to see what's reported there. Other tabs you might be interested in from the main view once you open up a scan is remediations. For instance, this particular remediation, essentially just upgrading that Linux box, would fix 103 vulnerabilities. Also, check on these notes. This has information about your scan and how you might be able to improve it. For instance, turning on a remote registry service would help out on many of the Windows hosts that we were trying to scan. Also, Unix compliance checks were not enabled. These are two things you might want to look into setting on uh, future policy changes. Since I had some problems scanning my Linux box earlier, I did two more scans, which I didn't show you setting up. But basically, it was the exact same thing, except for I added just the IP address of that Linux box where we did the exchange of public keys. Here's the one with creds, and here's the one without use of creds. As you can see, there's quite a bit of difference there. We can actually use some built-in functionality on Nessus to do a comparison between the two. And this is also useful for um, finding out what's changed between two scans. I can select both, drop down here, choose diff, and do a comparison. If I want to save that comparison out, I can actually click here. I have a couple of different options. I chose the PDF option. And choose what I want to have in my report. Export it. And hopefully it's going to be downloaded here before too awful long. And finish. You can save that report. Save the root. Close this window here. And let's take a gander at it. And here we have a nice little report we can give someone. All pretty and well laid out. Now there's a lot more to doing Nessus scans and a lot more to credential scans for that matter. But this is enough to get people started on getting credential scans up and running underneath Kali Linux with Nessus. If you happen to have any questions, feel free to contact me. Either email me at iongeek at iongeek.com or get a hold of me on Twitter. Also, this website is iongeek.com itself. You can go there and check out other videos I've done. Thank you for your time and I hope you've enjoyed the video.